begin then with our opening hymn. For that we will stand holy, holy, holy.
confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O oh Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the gift of God's word. Our Old Testament lesson for this Trinity weekend comes from Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. For our New Testament, we turn to the second chapter of Acts. But Peter standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you know yourselves. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says, he, he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to honor the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. 
Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A year ago this weekend, I preached my last sermon as an active, full-time pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Before starting retirement, I estimate that I preached about 600 times, not including weddings and funerals. That doesn't seem like much, but that was only over a 15-year span. Since then, including this weekend, I've preached 52 more times. So much for retirement. If asked if I'd be doing something special for that final sermon at my last church, my answer would have been yes and no. No, because it's not about me. It doesn't matter if it's my last, my first, or one of the 600 in between. Sermons should never be about anything but the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yes, it was special for the same reason it's always special. It declares the word of God. I never know what's going to happen when I preach. All I know is what God says in the 55th chapter of Isaiah. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Back in 2006, there was a truly amazing concert on television. It included 110 junior high and high school musicians known collectively as the Cleveland Youth Orchestra, a youth choir of another 60 teenagers, and the 1980s rock band Styx. Take a look for it on YouTube and see if you don't agree with me. It's amazing to watch. Like some rock groups from the 70s and the 80s, the members of Styx were classically trained musicians who could easily have earned their livings as members of symphony, symphony orchestras or featured artists in classical concerts. I guess they figured out there was better money to be made in rock music. But it was amazing to see and hear their music played and sung with a full symphony with strings and woodwinds and brass, even glockenspiels and kettle drums. Instead of loud guitars and playing familiar solo riffs too, Young men played cellos. Their fingers flew over the strings as they played incredibly fast music with instruments more suitable to playing slow, meditative pieces. Have you ever seen a fully scored music sheet? You know, that is a sheet, uh, sheet music for an entire orchestra. Every note for every instrument is what the conductor has before him on the podium. A short piece of maybe three or four minutes long fills a complete notebook. This, for example, is the opening line of the Star Wars theme. Da -da 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 Remember that? It takes all that. For a concert, the complicated score would take up file cabinets. But when you hear it, with everything so precisely tuned and accomplished, the beauty is astonishing. Today is the day in the church year when we celebrate something that is so complicated, so complex, that it makes a symphony seem simple. We celebrate that our God is three, yet one. Our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. Later, we will profess our Christian faith together using the words of the Athanasian Creed. This is the only Sunday of the church year that it is used. It seems complicated and a bit confusing. Maybe we need to say it slowly with a long pause between each clause for the majestic glory it describes is worth considering and pondering. Especially the second part of the creed, which proclaims the incredible mystery of how Jesus is both fully God and fully man. As in a great concert, there is a time to be in awe of the incredible details of the music and a time to be amazed at how the parts work in unified perfection. 
There is also time to relax and focus not on the details and the complexity of the performance, but simply to revel in it and to rejoice and re enjoy the finished product. As we look at a, a section of Peter's Pentecost sermon, which was our reading from Acts, we hear the symphony of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at work, preparing a masterpiece. As we see the three major components working together, may we realize the grace that is poured out on us as our God performs a concert of incredible grace. God the Father first does what Peter describes as attesting to Jesus. A word not used often these days, attesting, describes a more proactive role than just being a witness. It means to demonstrate and prove that to which you are showing. For example, if someone were to attest to the fact that I was once a skinny kid, they would put out a picture from my high school yearbook proving their claim. God the Father attests to the fact that Jesus is his only begotten Son, the Messiah. The hope long since promised to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, to Moses and Joshua, to Samuel and David, and to the rest of the prophets. But what Peter called mighty works, wonders, or by it, rather, what Peter called mighty works, wonders, and signs. These were things that no one but one approved by God could even comprehend, let alone accomplish. Works of healing, wonders of raising the dead, and signs as his teaching. 330 such events prophesied 400 to 3,000 years before his birth. Everything Jesus did was planned for him by the Father. The plan was set even to the fact that Peter's listeners would hand Jesus over to be killed, hung on a cross. God knew about this beforehand. He understood the cost, and he sent Jesus anyway, and then would raise him from the dead. We now see Jesus' role in the symphony, for he too knew what the crowd would do. But he went to the cross anyway, knowing the joy that it signified as well as the shame. He went in total agreement with his Father's will and divine plan. Remember this movie, Mr. Holland's Opus, 1995, starring Richard Dreyfuss? It was about a musician who wanted to be a composer or a conductor and to write and conduct his own symphony. But he took a teaching job, a teaching position, temporarily to earn a living and support his family. Thirty years later, forced to retire by budget cuts, Mr. Holland finally gets to conduct his symphony. If I were to write a symphony a company, uh, to accompany this part of the text, this part with, with Jesus on the cross would have an incredibly dark and heavy bass line, symbolizing the darkness and the weight of our sin, of the sin of the world, of all that sin oppressing us and separating us from God. And then, as Christ dies, the roll of heavy bass drums reach a crescendo, and all the low bass instruments for a moment strike a dark and minor chord then halt. But then, a piccolo begins to trill a bright high note, soon joined by every bright and joyous instrument in the orchestra as the music goes from dirge to dance, from hopeless depression to abundant hope, and from a life of emptiness to a life of celebration. That is the only way that I can picture death supposedly victorious, finding that no matter how hard it tries, it cannot hold Jesus. Our passage pictures death there, with its chains ripped apart as Jesus walks away, risen, reigning, triumphant. 
Peter points to a tomb that holds the greatest hero in Jewish history, the king and prophet and songwriter David. His bones have rested in the grave for a thousand years, but Jesus, killed by crucifixion, his bones lie in no grave. He is risen. He is risen. Thank you. Easter hasn't been that long. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And he has ascended. Peter shows us how much greater Jesus must be compared to King David. Even after 2,000 years, it is difficult to discuss one person of the Trinity, despite the descriptions of how he has worked and how the Father and Jesus promised he will work as he has sent to us. He was the subject of last week's message about Pentecost, but there is surprisingly little printed about him. But here, in the second chapter of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit being poured out on the apostles. Jesus had told them to stay in Jerusalem until this day, and on Pentecost, as Pastor Kurt shared with us last week, the Holy Spirit was manifested in them. The result was that 3,000 people gathered and heard Peter's message. There was so little mention of him because it is his job to point to Jesus. The testimony of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection is the primary way the Holy Spirit works on us and within us. He reveals Christ from Scripture, testifying to us, testimony that brings us faith and life, doing what the old translation of the creed says, quickening us. Quickening means to be brought to life. If we continue our reading from Acts, we would reach the conclusion of the first movement of God's symphony. The Holy Spirit working through the words of Peter shows the people that they killed God's promised one, Jesus, the Christ. The people are convicted. They are cut to the heart. They realize that they have done something horrible. Yet God, the Father, foreknew it and allowed it to happen. He planned it, and Jesus accomplished it. And through the Holy Spirit's action, 3,000 people believed and repented. Each time the word is proclaimed, the symphony begins another movement, another piece of work, and the word accomplishes what God intended. It brings us to life and to faith. And we rejoice as we see this life begin, as others realize that the dark stain of sin has been wiped away. And they rejoice with us, the love and joy and peace God given to us by our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Someday, the final movement will occur, and all the nations will gather before him as we, with millions upon millions of voices declare the holiness of God. Until then, we live with the promised Holy Spirit who was poured out on us in our baptism. The Holy Spirit whose names include Comforter and Counselor, the one who walks beside us, reminds us that we walk in the peace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. Amen. We join now in the singing of our hymn of the day, Lord of His Love through Humble Service.
our faith, our profession of our faith in the words of the Athanasian creeds. Whoever desires to be saved must above all hold the Catholic faith.
continue now with the prayers of the church. Father in heaven, thank you for revealing yourself to us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And thank you for keeping your promise to remain with us always through your Holy Spirit. Would that same Spirit teach us to continually recognize that the blessings we have received from you not only provide for our own temporal needs, but are also given to benefit others, both temporally and eternally. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Try you, God, we give thanks for the leaders you have sent to lead in your church and within each home. Bless all parents, grandparents, and all families that they might demonstrate what it means to live life under your fatherly guidance and lead them to others and lead others to you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for all pastors, teachers, church workers, and missionaries that they would continue to faithfully proclaim the gospel. Likewise, we pray that you would use all of us to do the same so that your message of salvation may be heard and received by those around us, Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, since you alone are the great healer and physician, pour out your healing grace so that our nation and its people would be moved to live in true harmony and peace, reflecting the love of Jesus Christ. Move us to set aside pride and dissent that we may humbly live as our brothers and sisters keepers. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, be with also with those who we have included in our prayers this past week, as well as those that we name now in our hearts and minds. According to your good and gracious will, give each person strength and mercy for each new day, along with full healing. Give them also hearts that find peace and joy, even in the midst of difficult circumstances so that they too may continue to serve as witnesses of the hope that we have in you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those who proclaim the one true faith to us, we give thanks to you, O Lord, and we pray that we may be found just as faithful by those who come after us. All glory, honor, and blessing and praise to you, O Lord, for you, for all your mercy. In the name of Jesus, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit reigns eternally as the one true God. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close with our closing hymn of blessed Holy Trinity. 